your homework and you read about now, we're ready to start again. And George, take note that <clears throat> we're starting 10 minutes past the hour. Only a five minute, a real five minute break next time. Oh, okay. You heard this morning about the fact that Francis Marion sort of traveled on sweet potatoes. And one of the accounts that I read when he was going to Parker's Ferry, he selected uh, 200 men that he knew he could trust. But he never told anybody where he was going. And they knew that they were going someplace a long distance because he had them put cornmeal mush and cooked sweet potatoes in their haversacks. So today, you're going to hear about Francis Marion and the sweet potatoes from Nell Weaver Davis. Welcome. <laughs> Greetings from Mason Lock Weens, home County, Anne Arundel County, Maryland. The church where he preached is just down the road from my house. I live in Anne Arundel County also. And the place where he was born, Herring Bay, is about a three hour <coughs> boat ride down the Chesapeake Bay. The road down which uh, the French general and Washington came uh, with their troops on their way to Yorktown goes through Anne Arundel County and our road signs say General's Highway. Also in Annapolis is the state capitol where George Washington gave his resignation speech uh, as, uh, as he resigned from the Continental Army. And it was there in the State House also that the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783. So if you wanted to ignore the Revolutionary War in Annapolis, not possible. My name is Nell Weaver Davies, as uh, Christine Swinger said. Before retiring, I was a commercial artist, and art will enter into this uh, talk to some extent. But first, I want to introduce you with proof that the soldier who handed over his sweet potatoes to General Francis Marion was Samuel Weaver. How do I know that? I read it in his pension application. He was Virginia born in Cumberland County, and at the time of the Revolutionary War, in 1780 that is, he lived in Surrey County, North Carolina. Now I had known about this uh, in a family history book since 1960, but there was no documentation. And frankly, I thought my father's cousin Myrtle was imagining everything. So in 1995, much to my surprise, I read the account of the sweet potato meal in his pension application. As a second objective of my talk, I'm going to show you some Revolutionary War paintings. And my theory is that the paintings uh, had the objectives of uh, instilling a sense of pride in the new country and passing along ideals and making us feel proud to be uh, Americans, a new country having defeated the most powerful country in the whole world, British, Great Britain. So both of these things will enter into my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to show you proof that Samuel actually did receive a pension. By then, by the end of the war, he was living in Kentucky. And this just states the amount of his pension. In 1742, I'm sure you can't read this, but I'll try to interpret it for you. He received $10 as a semi-annual payment for the year uh, eight, 17, I'm sorry, 1842. He also received $180 in arrears for uh, back payment uh, due him since 1840. This is just another um, proof of that he did receive a pension application uh, on the letterhead of the Treasury Department. 
you probably know the name Will Graves, and you may know the person. I understand he was a presenter here last year, and he has done most of us with some Southern uh, ancestry a great favor in transcribing over a thousand pension applications so that we can just uh, dial them up on the internet and read them. Um, this is Samuel Weaver's pension application. Uh, this describes the sweet potato meal, and I'll read it in case you can't see it. I guess you can, though. It's pretty big type. During the time he was with General Marion, a British officer, as he was told, came into camp, but for what he does not know. He, Samuel, was roasting and baking sweet potatoes on the coals. General Marion stepped up with the British officer and remarked he believed he would take up breakfast. He felt proud of the request, pulled out his potatoes, wiped the ashes off with a dirty handkerchief, placed them on a pine log, which was all the provision they had, and General Marion and the British officer partook of them. He has been told by some that this has been recorded in the life of the general as a dinner, but this was a breakfast. Well, that's another surprise. As a result of the uh, reading this, much to my astonishment, in this pension application, I decided to do some research and find as much out as I could about the sweet potato meal. So I proceeded to find Francis Marion biographies. I contacted museums, uh, libraries, uh, many of them in Charleston to try to find out what I could. And of course, uh, they referred me to the painting by John Blake White, which we all know, entitled General Marion Inviting a British Officer to Share a Meal. Uh, I was satisfied that uh, not only was the meal a real deal, there was a real meal, it wasn't a legend, and I was satisfied that Samuel Weaver was there, so I wrote a story to that effect. It was published in the Winter 99, 1999 edition of Carolog, which is the South Carolina Historical Society magazine. And just to prove that it really was there, this is the first page. Um, on the website of the U.S. Senate Art and History um, is the story of uh, the sweet potato meal and the painting by John Blake White, which you probably all know. Uh, they very nicely included um, a reference to Samuel Weaver's pension. As you see about the sixth line down, they include the story from the pension uh, about um, Santa Weaver being the person who cooked the meal. And there is the footnote of my story. Now, I picked four paintings from the Revolutionary War period, and these were not painted, uh, picked with any uh, preconditions of uh, what they might prove, but uh, I wanted to try to understand how much painting in that era influenced public opinion and how much people believed that a painting was actual fact or partially a fact or not at all a fact. Uh, this painting is probably very familiar to you. It's by John Trumbull. Uh, the larger version of it is in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. Uh, I believe that it pretty much represents uh, what I've read, the surrender of uh, General Lord Cornwallis. At your left, you see the French troops. At your right, you see the American troops. And General George Washington is seated on the brown horse, sort of in the mid-background, and the near the flag. As you know, Cornwallis did not attend the surrender. He pled in disposition. His second in command was Charles O'Hara, uh, general, and he was to present Cornwallis' sword to the commander of the winning army. He, in my opinion, very foolishly presented it to the French de Rochambeau, 
who very directly pointed him to George Washington, saying, that's the commander of the winning army. O'Hara tried to present the sword to, O'Hara, to George Washington, and George Washington merely pointed to Brigadier General Benjamin Lincoln, whom you see astride the white horse. You see his hand down to receive the sword. And there is the forlorn-looking Charles O'Hara beside the white horse, leading the British troops who were going to stack their arms. And the British band played the song, The World Turned Upside Down. This painting was one of the four commissioned uh, by Congress for the Capitol Rotunda. And as a commissioned painting, painting uh, it had to meet the specifications, not only of Congress, but also of President James Madison. If he did not approve of the way it was done, it was not put up at, in that way. So uh, this is an example of a commission work where the artist sticks to facts. Now the artist does not always stick to facts. There is such a thing as artistic license. And a definition of artistic license is the willingness to suspend disbelief at the discretion of the artist. I'm going to say that again because it sounds a little contradictory. The willingness to, dis, uh, to suspend disbelief at the uh, discretion of the artist, which means the artist can use his imagination. Now this next painting is called The Death of General Montgomery, the same artist. John Trumbull, not a commissioned painting. There you see General Richard Montgomery, the first really high-ranking officer to die in the Revolutionary War, uh, held in the arms of a comrade. The field is crowded with soldiers of both sides. Uh, if you know the story of the um, attack on Quebec, uh, Benedict Arnold was to take troops uh, around to the north of the city. Richard Montgomery was to take troops around to the south of the city, and they were to, on signal, attack at the same moment and capture Quebec. Uh, this painting does not represent what happened to General Montgomery at all. That night, it was December 31st, 1776. Um, 1775, I beg your pardon. Um, the General Montgomery led uh, four captains and their men down a steep and narrow path to the lower wall of the city of Quebec. Um, they had to break through the palisade to enter the city. And they broke through the palisade and approached a two-story blockhouse, which they assumed was not manned. It was manned. There was a volley of grave shot, General Montgomery, Captain John McPherson, Captain Jacob Cheeseman, and 11 men were killed instantly. And they, their bodies lay where they fell, in the snow, all night long. Now, General Montgomery was buried two days later by the British with, with honors. So you see that uh, this version of the event is entirely at the discretion of the artist to use that definition of artistic license. Now, we all love this painting. Uh, you can practically hear the band. Um, contrary to this painting, which was by Archibald uh, McNeil Willard, there were very few small boys who were involved as army musicians. There were, were some, but there was a researcher who looked at the pension applications of army musicians and discovered that the average age of the fifers was 18. The average age of the drummers was 19. And the reason was those drums were so heavy that a smaller boy would have great difficulty in carrying the, the drum, let alone uh, go on a long march carrying the drum. So the, um, uh, this picture, it, the icon of the very young Pfeiffer just simply is an exaggeration. Now this, 
the researcher found that the oldest age of an army musician was 39. And see this fellow in the middle? If he's 39, I'm 39. <laughs> but it's a great painting, and I'm not uh, being critical of any of these works of art as a work of art. They stand on their own merit. I'm just pointing out that uh, artistic imagination sometimes um, misrepresents the facts. Okay, here we have one of the most famous of the Revolutionary War. Washington Crossing the Delaware. This was painted in 1851 by Emanuel Gottlieb um, Lutz. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If someone will correct me. L-E-U-T-Z-E. Um, here we have George Washington against the light, silhouetted. Uh, there is uh, someone kneeling nearby. It was supposed to be James Madison, the future president of the United States. And there's our glorious flag. Well, the problem is the flag had not even been sunk at that point. It would not be adopted for another six months. Um, and uh, it was pitch black, really, that night, and raining and snowing, and the, you do see the ice flow in the river. And uh, not only that, but it would be more believable if, it had, if the boat had been going from west to east instead of east to west. <laughs> so this is the painting that historians love to paint. Now we're back to um, John Lake White's painting. Uh, this being the website of the US Senate Art and History. Um, if an artist wanted his painting to be famous outside of his hometown, in the case of John Lake White, it was Charleston, and even his region, he couldn't just run down to Ginkgo's and get copies. What they mostly did was make copies of the original painting, which John Blake White did. This one was dated 1810 and is on display in the Senate office building. This is another, um, a larger copy of the same painting. Just, it's dark, so you really can't see the details. All right, this one is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. You can see it a little better. You see the British officer, you see Marion, and to Marion's right, kneeling by the campfire, is that fellow Oscar, or Buddy, uh, who I contend was not the fellow who handed over his potatoes to General Marion, according to Samuel Weaver's pension application. It was a logical choice for John Blake White to paint a black servant, obviously. Uh, he was a plantation owner. Um, um, Marion was a plantation owner. Um, John Blake White knew Marion's family, although in 1781, the estimated date of the sweet potato meal, uh, Francis Marion was 50 years old, and that was the birth year of John Blake White's. So considerable difference in their ages. Perhaps you know of the Oscar Marion Project. You can look it up on the internet. Uh, this black servant was honored, uh, justly so, because he was a faithful servant of Francis Marion, serving all during the war, uh, a dual role, really, as a servant and a soldier. And he was with Francis Marion after the war. Uh, the Oscar Marion Project honored him in the U.S. Senate in the year 2006, and there was even a, a ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery in his honor. And I do not, for one moment, criticize this at all. I'm just saying Samuel Weaver was there, and Oscar was not. Okay, this is a third version of the same original painting done by John Blake White. This is owned by the Chicago Historical Society. Uh, same composition, same exact composition. 
this painting was donated to the Chicago Historical Society in 1932 by Mrs. Coburn. It is unframed and it is not on display at the present time. Okay, version number four. You must be getting a little tired of seeing this painting. I hope so, because <laughs> it does not represent the truth, in my opinion. This painting is the one that's closest to us at the University of South Carolina in the South Carolina Library Collection. There we have the general, uh, British officer, General Marion, and the black servant, and this strange fellow with that funny hat at the uh, edge of the painting. This, according to the website of the University of South Carolina, this painting is dated 1836. There were two stories on the website that chose that uh, listed the same date, 1836, for this painting. So now we have four original versions. This is a, just to show you there can be an oops in a museum. The young lady who sent me this slide uh, didn't see that the um, tape covered the title of it, so it came to me backwards on my computer. It also is in full color. This is not a black and white painting, but it is another artist who copied the composition by John Blake White. It is also unframed, and it is not on exhibition. It is, is at Winter Tour at the bequest of Henry DuPont. It is dated 1840. Now, in, also in 1840, the Apollo Association, which was a, an association backed by prominent New York people of considerable money to promote, the, uh, to promote American art, decided to commission John Sartain, who was a mezzotent engraver, to make a smaller copy of this painting. And the, he was to strike 1,000 copies of it, which were to be distributed to the members of the Apollo Association for the $5 uh, membership fee. So now we have 1,001 plus 4, 1,005. This is getting to be a lot of the same painting saying the same thing, which is wrong. William Gilmore Sims, artist, F.C. Strong, copied the same composition in his biography of Marion in 1844. And we see the $5 bill and the $10 bill of Confederate money. Maybe some of you have some of that, I don't know. Uh, the only difference in the engraving, you see Marion and the British officer, uh, is that the horse is facing the opposite direction. Okay, now we have Courier and Ives getting into the act in 1876, and I don't know how many uh, engravings that they distributed of the same painting, but there it is again. So is it any wonder that this case of mistaken identity was perpetuated through the 1800s? Now, a little comic relief. Here is Grant Wood's painting, uh, since I'm going to talk about Carson Mason Lock Weems. Uh, in, in 1939, Grant Wood, the artist, decided to depict George Washington doing his naughty naughty with a hatchet in the cherry tree. And if you look closely, you can see that George Washington, the boy, has the same face as on our one dollar bill. <laughs> so artists do have a sense of humor. <laughs> Carson Weems' uh, book, as you all know, was, was built upon notes by Peter Ory, uh, depicting the life and the wartime exploits of not only Francis Marion, but the Marion Brigade. Uh, Peter Ory did not find a publisher, and he turned to Carson Weems, who was already a successful author and a successful bookseller in, uh, in connection with Matthew Carey, who is a Philadelphia publisher. Uh, the first book, a biography of Francis Marion by Weems, was published in 1809, and it was 
was not illustrated. I contacted the Library of Congress to find out what the earliest illustration might be dated, and they had a copy in 1860, which had illustrations. I was not able to get copies of that. But thanks to the assistant librarian at Francis Marion University, the James A. Rogers Library, I asked her to send me uh, all the uh, copies of the illustration of the sweet potato meal in all the editions that they had in their library, and I have 14 or 15. Their first illustration, illustrated edition was 1822, and you can see it's a very different idea from John Blake White's painting. There's the British officer, General Marion, behind the fallen log on which they're sitting is a young white officer. Now, I'm not claiming that this is a portrait of Samuel Weaver. This was 1822. The meal was probably 1781, so a good many years have gone by. But I am maintaining there must be some reason for the selection of the character of the young white officer. And I can only attribute it either to Parson Weems or to the publisher, who said, this is a commission work. This is what I want to see as an illustration. The next one is 1825. And if it isn't the same artist, same engraver, whose name is unknown, uh, it's certainly a copy. Now, by 1829, we had a really superior artist who was engaged to, build, to make the six illustrations in the Parson Weems book. His name was Dr. Alexander Anderson. He was, he was a medical a doctor who gave up his practice because he liked engraving better than medicine. He, he worked on wood. His engravings were done on wood. Uh, he was already the foremost illustrator <coughs> in America. The New York Public Library has portfolios in their print collection of his. He chose botanical subjects, mythology, history subjects, portraiture. Uh, he has a, a great number of works at the New York Public Library. Uh, I think that his drawing of the bodies is much improved uh, as a critic of art, I guess I would say, than the two previous artists. Um, but he didn't change the composition. They're still the th same three guys, the same pile of potatoes, uh, same poses. And I wondered why, given an artist of, of higher skill, why this composition was not changed. Of course, we will never know that, but I posed the question to the librarian at Francis Marion University, and we came up with two possible answers. One was the cost of printing the book. Maybe it was just easier to copy what had been done before. The second one was, by this time, there had been several editions of Parson Wayne's book, and uh, maybe people expected to see these illustrations. So, well, as I said, we'll never know the exact, exact answer, but uh, those are two suppositions. Uh, Dr. Anderson had one imitator. This book was published in 1857, and it is a textbook for fifth graders. There are the three in the same pose, uh, the, it was a um, lesson plan. The children were to read about the sweet potato meal, and they were to be asked questions as a test. Now, we're back to the guy we all love to hate, Bannister Tarleton. I show you this because it's a standing portrait, and you may know what he's standing upon. And what he is standing upon are the three battle flags of the Virginia companies that were cut to pieces at Waxhaws. I learned that on Flag Day, June 14, 2006, uh, a descendant of his had sent these flags back to the United States to be auctioned at Sotheby's. 
and they brought in $17.3 million. Uh, they have been on display at the College of William & Mary. I don't know if they're permanently there, but it's nice to know that those battle flags are back home. Now, I should say a word or two more about Samuel. Uh, this, this whole contention of mine doesn't make Samuel Weaver a hero. This sweet potato meal probably took 15 minutes of his life, maybe two hours of Francis Marion's. But I consider it a historical fact, and I have great respect for historical truth. If he was there, he was there. He had to appear in court as any um, pensioner or pros prospective pensioner had to do and swear that his testimony about his wartime service was correct. He had to produce witnesses who would also swear that he was a truthful person. Uh, one of them, Abraham Hunter, said that he had often heard Samuel Weaver say that he didn't want to apply for a pension because he didn't want to, it to be said that he was a beggar, like me on Medicare. Mm -hmm. That he fought for freedom, not for money. But at age 87, he did decide to apply for pension. Uh, I think, based on what I, little I know about him, that one reason he decided to apply for pension was if he received a pension, then his wife, who was almost 10 years his junior and would probably be a widow someday, if his pension were approved, then probably her pension would be approved. And that's the way it worked out. Uh, Samuel applied for pension in September, in 18, originally in 1840. He was given a pension in September 1842, and he died two months later. Mary Bollinger Weaver <coughs> applied for pension in 1843, and she died in 1844. So the government didn't have to spend a lot of money on either Samuel or Mary. Now, when this fellow called um, Francis Marion, that damned fox. The devil himself couldn't catch him. The swamp fox name was meant to be pejorative. It was meant to be insulting. But now when we say swamp fox, we say swamp fox. Yeah, that's a good thing. He knew the territory. It was swampy territory. And he was wily enough to outwit the British time after time after time. And helped uh, to a great extent, I feel, in the defeat of the British Army. So um, I appreciate your listening to this, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. temporary duty. 
uh, with Francis Marion. He, he was four weeks, his company in the North Carolina militia was with Francis Marion in South Carolina. And there were, I can remember there were three or four skirmishes with the Tories. And a couple of names you might remember, you Francis Marion experts. Um, uh, some Tories were captured and seven were killed, but there was a Edmund Fanning, he was mentioned, and a Colonel, uh, I'm sorry, Captain Cunningham. There were a lot of Cunninghams on both sides, so I can't tell you which Cunningham it was, but uh, presumably it was Torridge. And, uh, so that's all I know about Francis Mary Ann Sentinel. Anything else? I just want to bring the fact that Carlton was a redhead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it seems to me you that the whole, yeah. the whole painting is fanciful, for one thing, and we've got our experts back here. Did you know that Francis Marion set up tents in the swamp? And the uniform is not right. You're talking about the Weems illustration. Yeah. And then the uniform is not right. It, it looks Civil Warish. It was it, well, and he, and he, Yeah, and he wore it, what, the last attack at Georgetown, he got a new uniform of Continentals, and the Continentals would have been uh, blue with with the facing, uh -huh. uh, red facing, and he would have worn a hat like that one right over there, not the silver one he had on his head, mm -hmm. because his was scorched, but he, he uh, that's the helmet of the second south. So I don't know about the British uniform, but it just seemed that Francis Marion was sort of that was a fanciful sort of thing. And besides, he had deformed ankles and knees, not those pretty yeah. slender legs. That, uh, uh, it, it John the John Blake The John Blake White And the kind of uh, fight that he had, I just don't think he'd be wearing spotless white breeches. No. <laughs> 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 So actually, you, you know, they've got him in, in like a dress uniform, and, and, and the British officer looks pretty great too. Mm -hmm. But I have seen another uh, version of that, and instead of either a black or white uh, doing the breakfast, there was a, uh, it looked like the, the Greek fertility god. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was symbolic of something, yeah. uh, but uh, it, it was a very strange, if, if the, the, the officer was there, Francis Marion, very much like in those days, but, uh, but that, that other has been replaced and uh, by a, a figure that, a little like figure that had some significance. Well, but I don't know enough about art to know what it was. I'm going to pick up on, on your phrase, mythical kind of significance. Uh, one last story. Many of the American painters went to London to study with Benjamin West, who was a famous uh, American artist, an expatriate who was appointed official historical painter to George III. Now, we have Benjamin West to thank because he stopped the European precedent of dressing everyone in classic Greek and Roman attire. And can you imagine the signers of the Declaration of Independence <laughs> looking like a University of Maryland toga party? <laughs> Thank you, Benjamin West. <laughs> Okay, you'll have to do it.